I want to uh, thank Pastor Sue as I begin uh, for inviting me to preach uh, this morning. And uh, she is off on a walk to Emmaus, an uh, uh, experience uh, many uh, folks here have been encouraging her to uh, uh, participate in, and she was uh, pleased to be able to go uh, for her first walk this weekend. And uh, I have the opportunity to be here to preach. Um, you may know that St. John's has a very deep bench when it comes to preaching. Uh, there are a number of retired pastors, both United Methodist and other uh, other denominations that are regular participants uh, here in St. John's. And so uh, there are many persons to choose from uh, when there is an opening. And there's even a spare pastor in the parsonage. So, um, you know, there's just so many places to go uh, when uh, Pastor Sue needs a Sunday away. Now, some of you, if you've noticed the title for the sermon this morning, may have recognized it as a punchline. Practice, practice, practice. The joke, of course, is how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. Now, I was uh, thinking about practice in my life. Um, I have to admit that I was never very good at it. I was not a sports team member. I I did play trumpet when I was young, and I even uh, played up until I was a freshman in high school, which included... Uh, being in the marching band. Now, I watch marching bands now, and they march and do shows with, with incredible amounts of music, and uh, they do it all without the little music. Now, when I was in band, we still were allowed to have the music on the little stand on your trumpet. You didn't have to memorize song after song after song. Uh, but even with the music, I was challenged a bit. And actually, after that freshman year of high school, um, my uh, class schedule actually conflicted with band. And I remember having to tell uh, the band teacher, Ernie George, who was actually an old big band trumpeter, uh, that I wouldn't be able to participate in band in future years. And I did pay a price. Ernie was not your typical music teacher. As I said, he had been a big band trumpeter and he was a bit hard-edged. And uh, I think I actually came out of that uh, particular session in tears that day when I told him I wouldn't be in the band the next year. The fact is that the desire to practice has to come from a place somewhere within us. Now, certainly when you're part of a team and and you're going to practice to learn whatever sport you're a part of or or whatever uh, skill you are trying to perfect, Uh, There is that idea of the team carrying you in and and helping you and and maybe even a little bit of the competition that goes on within the team that encourages you in the practice, in learning the skill you're trying to understand. For me, uh, the things that I have probably most practiced in my young life were throwing a frisbee Now, I have to tell you, I learned to throw a Frisbee for the first time when my father was pastor up in Bangor, Maine, and we had a a couple of young adults stay stay with us at our house for a couple of days. I I don't remember. They were part of a mission or something. Uh, They were from California, and this was probably uh, 1967, and they taught me how to throw a Frisbee. And I became synonymous with Frisbee. If you, if you knew anyone who went to Mechuana back in the days when I worked there, uh, and you mentioned my name, they said, isn't that the guy who throws the Frisbee? I was the Frisbee guy. And I can't tell you that I ever really practiced Frisbee. I played Frisbee. And this was before uh, the, the idea of ultimate Frisbee even really existed, at least on this coast. I, suspect they were playing it in California long before we were playing it here. Uh, But for me, it was just the challenge. And sometimes people would say, I don't like playing Frisbee with you, Wes, because I never have to move my feet. You always throw it right to me. And that drove them a little crazy. The other thing that I have to admit that I practiced a lot was juggling. Uh, My freshman year at Tufts University, I started out as an engineering student. uh, uh, That didn't uh, stay the course over time. I actually decided to steer away from engineering 
when my roommate came back from his introduction to engineering class, which he was taking first semester, and started talking to me about planned obsolescence. I decided I didn't want to spend my life planning for when things would wear out. That's when I became a biology major. <laughs> but my freshman year at Tufts, um, I learned to juggle. And I would spend hours juggling. And at one point, a, a, a gentleman who lived down the hall from me, uh, he actually said to me once, he said, Wes, I wonder how many times you can throw the balls uh, without dropping one. And he challenged me around that. And I think it was a slow day at school. And I started to do this in the hall. And he and a couple of other people started counting. When we got to 10,000 throws, we stopped. Now, um, while I was doing that, people were coming and going up and down the halls, and they'd look at me kind of strangely, depending on uh, who they were or what they knew. Uh, but at one point, a, a guy who lived all the way down at the other end of the hall, he was actually a, a student from Belgium. His parents were visiting that day. And they walked by, and they saw what was going on, and you could kind of hear the conversation as they moved down the hall. Why is he wasting his time doing that? Clearly, there was great judgment on. And I can imagine after they got into his room, I can't imagine what his parents would think if they knew what they were paying for him to be here. And all he's doing is learning how to juggle. <laughs> now, at that time, I didn't know I was going to be a pastor. That came up a little bit later in my college career. But I can't tell you how many times I've used juggling in ministry, whether it was youth group events, uh, whether it was even giving a sermon. And I had considered juggling this morning, but I am a little out of practice. And my wrist was hurting yesterday, and I decided not to do it. But so many times I've gone back to my juggling. And I've used it uh, just for fun, but sometimes to teach and sometimes to engage. And it's really been a tremendous gift to me and my ministry and just my life. My, my oldest son learned to juggle from me and went on and, and did it all kinds of places in all different ways for many different years. And for me, at a point, it was just a silly thing. Uh, but there was some part of me that enjoyed it and appreciated it. And that's why I could practice it. It was play for me, but there was also practice involved. So I was thinking about this idea of practice. And I was remembering a young woman who I met a couple of years ago. She's actually a granddaughter of one of our retired pastors in Maine. And a couple of years ago, she came uh, to be the musical entertainment at the Christmas gathering for the retired pastors of Maine. And in my position with the Preacher's Aid Society, I usually attend that gathering. She, her, she and her father came, and, and she is a violinist. Her dad plays uh, keyboard, and, and because it was close to Christmas, they did a lot of Christmas music, but she also played some other pieces. And I was very impressed, and probably at the time, I'm not sure, she might have been a freshman in high school. And it was clear that she was really gifted as a violinist. And so I, I had gone online. She mentioned having videos online, and so I found her on Facebook, and then I found her on Instagram. And I, I followed her in both of those places. And what I learned over time was that Instagram had actually become a tool for her in her practice for her violin. And, and this year, especially, as I watched on Instagram, and I, I don't have time to watch all her videos because she posts a video almost every day. But what she posts videos of is of her practice. There'll be a particular passage in in a, a, a piece that she's been struggling with or whatever, and she will repeat it over and over and over and over again. And what I happened to notice as I was thinking about her this week, I went back to Instagram again. Uh, she had set a goal this year of practicing a 1,000 hours. Now, for those of you who aren't mathematicians, that means two and three quarters hours every day of the year on average. Now, you know, 
if you had kids who played an instrument and, and you kind of would push them around practice, you know, a, a good half hour a few times a week was like, thank goodness we got that much. But here's someone, and, and she literally, on her Instagram, each, each time she posts a video, she gives the hours that she has given. Some days it can be four and five. And if she's had a particular difficult concert or something that she's done, a performance, she actually uh, uh, had a concert uh, with the Korchmar organ at Portland City Hall a, f a little bit ago, and she took a couple of days off after that. The stress of doing a public performance and, and all of the energy that goes into that kind of thing, it's, it's almost like getting up to preach, really, I'll tell you. It's, uh, there's a lot of energy involved. And she'd take a day or two off. So there are days that she has to practice four and five hours. And so I checked uh, this morning to see where her count is at uh, here mid-November. She's at 951 hours of violin practice. I think she's a junior in high school. That is commitment. That is something that, that someone has discovered within them, a spark and an understanding of a gift and a desire to bring it to its fullness in a way that, that many of us might not understand. It's not her parents making her do it. She's her own harshest critic. I mean, literally, she has videos where all she does is keep the, keep the violin under her chin, holds it with her chin, literally, and the practice is moving her hand and her bow back to the right position over and over again. Because literally what happens is the body memory happens. It becomes instinctual to do what is necessary to play the pieces, the most challenging ones. Other videos, she's, she's just simply learning to bounce the bow to accomplish a particular passage in a piece that she's been trying to play for years. Or she'll talk about the fact that a teacher told her, try this. Isolate the one arm, only do what that arm does, and do it over and over and over again. Don't do what the left hand needs to do. Just do the bow work. And she'll do that for hours. She's trying to perfect it. She's trying to get it to the place where she thinks it will be a full expression of the music that she's trying to play, and what the composers wanted the people to hear when it was shared as a public performance. Practice, practice, practice. Now, if I uh, grab this wireless mic and came out into the audience this morning. Everybody gets real nervous when a pastor says that. I'm not going to. And ask the question of you, why do you come to worship? The fact is that all of you would probably have a different answer. There are certain answers that might very well come up. I come to say thank you to God. I come to feel the fellowship of this community. I come because I need the prayers of this gathered body. There are so many different reasons. My suspicion as well is if I asked you, why did you go to worship when you were 10? Why did you go to worship when you were 30? Why did you go to worship when you were 50? That your reasoning might have changed along your life path, there have probably been many different reasons that you've come to worship. And this morning, I want to add one. I want to give you another option for the answer to that question. Why do you come to worship? Years ago, I heard someone say, actually, I can't remember whether I heard it said or read it, but what it is, is this understanding that worship is practice for life. That worship 
is practice for life. Now, that understanding has always been a part of who I am ever since I heard it. And um, I have to tell you that since I stopped uh, preaching every week in my new job, I, I preach probably a third of the Sundays a year, and uh, I give the same sermon every time. Now, it's not this one. Uh, this, is, this is a fresh one today. Um, uh, but um, I, I give the same sermon 18 to 20 times a year with slight variations as I go out and talk about the Preacher's Aid Society. Um, but there was a period uh, when, after I had changed to my new job, we hadn't yet found a church to attend. And we were kind of bouncing around. Um, and then there was a period when we really weren't making it to church. And all of a sudden, I understood that things weren't right for me when that was the case. That not being in worship meant that there was something missing in my life. Meant that there was something that, that wasn't full and complete in my week and in my days. That that missing piece was too big not to fill back in. Now, as it turns out, uh, my decision to fill it back in allowed me to arrive here at St. John's. And I've been glad of that decision. To be able to participate here in worship and, and to be reminded of the rhythm that worship offers to our lives. But to understand that it is practice for life. Now, the fact is that we practice things at many different levels. When you first start practicing something, uh, sometimes you really struggle with it. You, you make mistakes over and over and over again, and oftentimes it's, it's the same mistake that you make. And, and the reason you continue to practice is to try and overcome that, to get that little bit better, and to find your way to the place where you understand how to do it and make it work. When we come to worship, there's a whole lot that goes on here. Uh, you may know that, that uh, what the uh, outline of the worship is called is the liturgy. But the understanding of liturgy is actually, the, the definition of it is the work of the people. Now, I know sometimes when you're in worship, it feels like everything is going on up front. That it's just, uh, you know, the folks up front are doing it and I'm here to watch. But worship is an act that all of us participate in together. And that's why there are unison prayers. That's why we all listen to the scriptures together. That's why we all sing the hymns together. It is an act of community that we participate in when we worship together. But worship as practice for life. Think about the parts and the pieces that happen here. Right from the time you walk in the door, you seek to be a part of community. You find a way to express who you are so that others might get to know you and that they might understand that, that you want to be here, not just for yourself, but for others. When we start speaking the words, we, we sing songs of praise because we want to know how to say thank you to God. But I believe that learning how to say thanks to God is a way to understand how to give thanks for the blessings in our lives outside of this time. How to say thank you to others. And to make sure that we don't allow our gratitude to go unexpressed in our moment-by-moment -moment lives outside of worship. Oftentimes in worship, we, we share a prayer of confession. It's an opportunity to, uh, to bow before God and say, God, I'm so sorry for the ways in which I have not lived out the life you want me to live, the ways I've fallen short in my life. Years ago, uh, when I was pastoring a church uh, uh, up in northern New Hampshire, uh, there was an elderly man uh, who would come to worship when he could, 
but he was getting uh, frailer all the time, and he required, it required a lot for him to come to church. And I had gone to visit him at home one day, and he said to me, you know the thing I miss most when I'm not able to be at church is the prayer of confession. For him, that was the peace that reminded him to be humble, that reminded him that he needed God, that he needed forgiveness, that he needed to say he was sorry. And so we arranged that any time he could not be in church, he got a copy of the bulletin. This was before the days of email and just sending off that email with whatever someone needs. So we made sure that someone could get the bulletin to his house and he could read that prayer of confession, maybe not in the midst of the community, but at least at home and have that learning for himself that week. The offering is a reminder to us of the need to be generous the need to give back. And even though in church we're, we're seeing that as giving back to God, uh, in this parish, you're constantly, constantly giving back to others. You're constantly finding a way uh, to express God's love outside the norm that you might in your own life. And, and, you know, you look at what's happening towards Thanksgiving here as the youth group is collecting food to make up baskets and, and there's a gathering to uh, create a Thanksgiving meal for the people in recovery. These are opportunities to be generous. These are opportunities to give back. But we don't just do that in church. We need to learn to do it every day in our lives. Every opportunity we see where our generous heart might make the difference where our practice of God's love might make a change in someone else's life and perspective. Years ago, a friend uh, who actually was best man at my wedding uh, called me and said, uh, uh, Wes, I've gotten engaged, and uh, I'd, I'd like you to do the service. And uh, I had moved, and, and so we were a little farther apart than we had been for many years, and uh, uh, I said, oh, I'd love to. And so we set up a time for me to come and meet with he and his fiance. And it was literally the first time I had met her. And uh, my friend was not a church friend. Uh, I had met him through mutual friends many years before. Uh, and he had, uh, you know, he had a faith that, that had been on and off. Uh, but his fiance was not a church person. And so we sat down to dinner, and uh, one of the first things she said to me, I've never met a practicing minister. Now, the fact is, there's a lot of people in the world who can actually say that. Um, uh, and that's the reality of our world. And uh, uh, But... But when she said it, it came across so weird to me. I mean, at that point, I'd probably been in ministry 15 or 20 years. And my initial reaction was, well, I'm really not still practicing. I think I've kind of got the hang of it. But, <laughs> but the reality is, is that practicing has so many understandings. We don't just practice as we start out. We practice all along. We practice in our daily lives and ritual to get to that place where our expression of God's love is so much a part of us that our very body memory of how to do this, how to be like Christ, just flows out of us in all that we do and all that we are. And so there's a part of me that wants to go back and, and claim that. Oh yeah, I'm practicing. I'm really trying to practice every day what it is that God is trying to teach me and where it is that God is trying to lead me. Our reading from 1 Timothy this morning, it comes from that, uh, 
that letter that was really written to a young pastor, a young leader in a congregation. And, and the author is, is basically trying to give instruction around uh, uh, what needs to happen in order for that pastor to be effective in the work that they're trying to accomplish. And the language is literally right in there. Put these things into practice. Read scripture, show holiness, do the things that are going to be impressing others with who you are in your image of Christ. Now that letter was written to a pastor. And the pastor was supposed to go out and demonstrate uh, through their lives how others were to live. But I want to tell you that the language is just as much to each and every one, not to just the leaders, but the ones who are in the pews, the ones who make up the church. Put these things into practice. There's a word um, that we use uh, sometimes in Methodism. It's actually uh, quite important to John Wesley. It's called sanctification. It's the understanding how, of how God uh, moves us in our lives, uh, is always uh, moving us on toward perfection. Now, now you may struggle with that understanding that... that uh, uh, you would ever try to think that you were going to seek to be made perfect in God's love. It's actually among the questions that are asked of those of us who are ordained in the Methodist uh, process. Do you understand that you're moving on to perfection, that you're going on to perfection in this life of love that you follow in Jesus Christ? And and you don't want to claim that as bragging rights. You want to claim that as an understanding that you understand you're moving toward that. And one of those other uh, things that we often say about practice, what do we say? Practice makes perfect. And so if we understand that worship is practice for life, if we understand that when we come into this place, uh, we are trying to uh, perfect the way we're going to live out our lives as Christians in the world, then coming into this place, being a part of this community, is so essential. Because God desires for us to grow in this walk to grow in love, to understand the practice that Christ has set before us. And so I'd encourage you to think about your worship as practice for life. Think about the things that you struggle with in your day-to-day -day life and wonder how you might use this community and this space, this place, to learn more about them. Do you struggle to share your own prayer concerns? Do you struggle to pray for others? Do you struggle with generosity? Do you struggle with saying, I'm sorry, to the ones you love? Use this place. Use God's spirit. Use the gift of this community, which I pray is a safe place for you to make mistakes and to practice. To let, get a little better each time you come in, that when you go out, others might see that reflection of Christ a little bit more perfected in your life that they too might be inspired to live in that way. May we continue to practice these things in the love of Christ and knowing that God seeks to make us perfect in this life and in the life beyond. Amen.